agradecerles por el tiempo eh, y la disposición a eh, entregarnos su conocimiento en torno a este tema. Quisiera agradecer eh, también especialmente a los vicerrectores de investigación que contribuyeron eh, a eh, el desarrollo de este seminario, a investigadores que fueron parte de nuestro comité editorial, vi a Cristian González por ahí, eh, no los veo a todos, así que perdón si me salto alguno, pero al grupo importante de personas que contribuyó a que esto ocurriera, incluidas las Ceremis de Ciencia, y en particular a Catalina Terra, que es quien ha eh, gestionado, involucrado y hecho que todo este seminario ocurra, así que eh, muchas gracias por toda la dedicación eh, y el tiempo. Este seminario eh, se enmarca en un contexto nacional y un contexto global muy especial. Nosotros estamos en pleno proceso de instalación de la nueva institucionalidad de ciencia, tecnología, conocimiento e innovación, con la creación de un ministerio y el reemplazo de nuestra antigua Comisión Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología por la nueva Agencia Nacional de Investigación y Desarrollo. Este proceso de transformación ha requerido eh, no solo reformular y reorganizar nuestra agencia, sino que pensar de un modo estratégico cómo organizamos nuestro trabajo de manera transversal, cómo podemos aprender como institución en todas nuestras áreas respecto de aquellas eh, tareas y funciones que son del corazón eh, de lo que nosotros hacemos. Y este seminario apunta precisamente a eso. Hoy día, del universo de actividades que hace la agencia, eh, quizás la más crítica tiene que ver con los procesos de evaluación. Eh, CONICIT y la NID han trabajado durante años en contar con evaluaciones eh, de excelencia que nos posicionan hoy día como una agencia seria, que trabajamos de manera coordinada con otras agencias de la región, eh, a partir del cual se ha construido eh, parte importante del sistema científico nacional, un sistema científico que es robusto, maduro, que tiene altas tasas de publicación y que viene asociada a universidades que son de nivel global. Ese proceso, eh, ese proceso de evaluación, que es como el, el, el engranaje que articula todo lo que se hace dentro de la agencia, es un proceso que, eh, si bien funciona, requiere estar constantemente eh, siendo mirado. Eh, así, así lo hemos hecho desde la agencia, eh, y quienes conocen el trabajo eh, de nuestros equipos han visto cómo, de la mano de nuestros distintos consejos y asesorados por expertos, hemos ido... Eh, modificando lentamente y mejorando los procesos de evaluación. Eh, pero no es un tema que atiende solamente a la agencia. Hoy día estamos en un proceso eh, de cambio y de movimiento en torno a muchas otras áreas. Eh, la agencia está eh, terminando su proceso de instalación. La CNA, la Comisión Nacional de Acreditación, publicó hace algunas semanas los nuevos lineamientos para acreditación que tienen que ver con nuestros instrumentos, que tienen que ver con los proyectos de la NID y con los procesos de evaluación. Y eh, desde el Ministerio, esta lógica de avanzar desde investigación más básica hasta emprendimiento científico-tecnológico, también nos ha hecho revisitar y mirar qué es lo que queremos lograr con nuestros instrumentos, con el financiamiento que se hace con la agencia, y por supuesto, eh, a través de los distintos mecanismos de evaluación que hoy día existen. Esto que vivimos nosotros en Chile no es exclusivo nuestro. Eh, a nivel global, eh, la declaración de San Francisco, Dora, la declaración de Leiden, eh, y el movimiento y cambios que han hecho eh, instituciones tan importantes como las agencias en Canadá, la UPI en Inglaterra, eh, y por mencionar algunas, son muchas más, dan cuenta de una preocupación que no es solo local, eh, es una preocupación que se da a nivel internacional, eh, donde existen experiencias, eh, positivas, otras no tan positivas, con aprendizajes incorporados y que es parte de lo que nosotros vamos a intentar traer a través de nuestras pantallas en los próximos días y durante este seminario. En razón a eso, eh, y para quienes pudieron revisar el programa, nuestro seminario está compuesto principalmente por expertos internacionales. Queremos escuchar la voz de los expertos y queremos usar esto como telón de fondo para una discusión que esperamos se prolongue durante los próximos meses y nos permita reflexionar realmente sobre cuál es el mejor mecanismo, cuál es eh, el mejor balance entre los distintos mecanismos de evaluación que existen y qué es lo que mejor se ajusta 
a las realidades de nuestro país, eh, manteniendo por supuesto eh, la, la excelencia que es el componente esencial eh, de cualquier proceso de evaluación por una agencia de investigación y desarrollo como la nuestra. Estas preguntas eh, nos van a forzar a discutir y a reflexionar sobre eh, la tensión entre el mérito de la propuesta y el mérito del investigador, sobre eh, la necesidad de eh, contar con muchas evaluaciones pares o criterios objetivos que de alguna manera reduzcan sesgo. Nos va a forzar a entender cuáles son los sesgos que tenemos hoy día como comunidad que se transfieren en nuestros procesos de evaluación sesgos que tienen que ver con el género, con las disciplinas, eh, con el efecto Matthews, que llaman algunos, y con cualquier otro que exista en el proceso. Entonces, eh, el objetivo de estas primeras palabras es más bien dar contexto. Eh, nosotros hoy día como agencia, y gran parte del equipo de la agencia está hoy día conectado en esta reunión, estamos en una posición de eh, escuchar y aprender. Eh, Queremos, eh, a través de los expertos internacionales que nos van a hablar durante los próximos días, invitar a una conversación a la comunidad científica y sobre todo tomar esta instancia como un punto de partida a una conversación que esperamos que sea abierta, participativa, democrática, que nos permita a todos en conjunto y como comunidad encontrar las mejores recomendaciones respecto de cómo avanzar en mejorar nuestros sistemas de evaluación desde la Agencia Nacional de Investigación y Desarrollo. Así que, sin más, le quiero dar el pase a nuestros expertos eh, para que puedan, por favor, eh, tomar el micrófono y dar inicio a su presentación. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, directora Echeverry. Agradecemos su, sus palabras. A continuación, y dando inicio al panel Tendencias Globales y Cambios en la Evaluación de la Investigación dentro de fondos competitivos, Escucharemos al señor Frédéric Sgar, quien se desempeña como gestor en el Global Science Forum dentro de la OCDE. Él ha sido consultor en varios consejos científicos y obtuvo su doctorado en biología molecular. También cuenta con una larga experiencia en la industria farmacéutica. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. It's a, it's a very interesting topic, obviously. We have been interested in the problem, the general problem of research funding of course, for many years at the OECD. And, and more recently, uh, if we can have the presentation, um, we have conducted a work on competitive research funding. So uh, a large part of my presentation will be to, uh, you know, picked up from lesson learned from the work we did on competitive research funding. And then I will focus more on the research assessment, obviously, because this is a topic of, of today. Uh, more by raising challenges and questions rather than providing solutions first, but then we can discuss solutions. Next slide. Yes, so that's, that's a report which is available online, uh, which provides a lot of information on um, operation of competitive research funding systems. Next slide, please. So the first element that we have to take into account of this study is that Competitive research funding that use, you know, various ways of, of assessment can be used for uh, multiple objectives. And that's something we come back several times because it is extremely important to tailor your system, including your assessment mechanism, to your strategic objective. So you have many objectives that may be uh, implemented by the funding scheme. Uh, it can fund you know, interdisciplinary research, uh, individual researchers or laboratories, frontier knowledge, capacity building, um, international collaboration, etc. And they quite often overlap. You quite often have many different objectives for one single funding scheme. And obviously, that complexifies the task of the reviewers. So that means that you not only have to assess the scientific quality, but additional objective within the assessment. And that's an issue we'll come back. Next slide, please. So this is a sort of a general typology of competitive funding schemes. Um, basically, what you can see is that there is a various categories of who is applying. So it comes from the individual up to the institution. And then on the other hand, you have you start from sort of blue sky fundamental research up to mission led or applied research. But 
the thing is, it's extremely viable, and it's very hard to map a particular type of competitive scheme to another category of applicant or allocation process. Because everything is, is mixed, and you have all the types which are present in all countries. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the advantages of having a competitive funding system? So first, it tends to increase the quality of the proposal and the relevance of research projects in function of your objective. It is a way, a, a way to ensure that the research awards meet a minimum standard of quality. Basically, uh, because you have an evaluation process, you ensure that the proposal have that sort of quality, you know, expected quality. It doesn't mean that having internal research within the funding institution does not meet this requirement, but it is an extra step, okay? And a sort of a learning element, which is always forbidden, is that it does provide the researchers that you know, make proposals an opportunity to test their ideas among peers because they are evaluated by the peer reviews, right? And if the assessment is correctly done, there is a feedback. And quite often, too, when you prepare a research proposal, you exchange with your colleagues because you want to make the best proposal. So there is, you know, it's, it's, it fosters discussion and, and and help improve the quality of the project. And then, again, if it's correctly done, it builds trust in the community that getting money is done fairly on the basis of, you know, correct criteria, you know, um, which are objective and not subjective, contrary to, you know, having just your boss that delivers money to whatever he feels is you know most important and which sometimes can be biased okay so it's sort of a more neutral way in theory in theory a more neutral way to deliver money next slide please but of course there are disadvantages uh, the first one is that if you rely a lot on competitive funding it tends to um have a bias towards more short-term project lower risk project rather than long-term higher risk future why yes because well you want to be successful and we we'll come back to that the research evaluation system tend to avoid taking too much risk um they, they you know there is a sort of a accountability of the reviewing process too and if suddenly uh, they end up that having 50 percent of the project that they formed not delivering publication of course you know they will be criticized so we'll come back to that because it's a real issue then it's very time consuming for the researchers and for the administration of the research funding agency. It's time consuming, it, it requires a lot of administration, process, etc. So both, both for the research community and for the research agency, it has a cost. And that's quite often underestimated, actually not estimated at all. Again, that's a real challenge. And then there is the difficulty for researchers and institutions that depend too much on competitive research funding to do long-term planning because you know if they only have short-term grants that means it's very hard for them to have very ambitious long-term projects okay so there is a need for a balance here and you have to be aware that you cannot only have competitive funding next slide please Okay, so when we, you know, we did a, a sort of a very broad survey among, you know, a very large number of competitive research funding mechanisms, about 80 of those in all countries, and a critical element, you know, that everybody is interested in is the success rate. Okay, what is my, my chance of being funded if I submit a proposal? And what you find is it runs from below 10% to up to 100%. Well, 100% 100 percent you're going to ask you know is that a competitive funding scheme well not really of course this is more for institutional funding which in theory is competitive but basically there is sort of a, a pre-discussion that institutions that are unlikely to get the funding are discouraged to apply and at the end of the day you know everybody gets it okay but if you go to the more traditional funding schemes what you see is that most of them fall into the 10 to 13 percent success rate and actually if you add the below 10 percent and the 10 to 20 percent you are over the majority over 50 percent that is an issue i'll come back to that next slide please 
So what are the recurrent challenges that we identified? Well, the first thing is what I mentioned earlier. There is a true cost of competitive funding schemes. And, and that is usually not accounted for into the research system itself. So you have to weigh the cost benefits of having a competitive funding mechanism. And that again is related to your strategic objective. Is it worth it? If it is, because you consider that the positive aspects are worth spending the time, then you should go for it. But in some cases, it's not worth it. And this is when we come back to the success rate. If you have below 10% of the success rate, besides the fact that, and I come back to that, it's just impossible to do a real reviewing uh, assessment of the proposal at that you know, percentage of, of success, but there is a cost. That means you are assessing 90% of proposal you will not be funding. So it's extremely costly per funded proposal. So there is a, a challenge is, which is how you know, can I reduce the time, the expenses and the administrative burdens of competitive funding schemes? For instance, you know, are five reviewers better than three? And I don't have the answer here, but it's just an open question. And if we have time, you know, maybe we want to come back to the looking at all, all the funding schemes that were set up in emergency regarding the COVID-19 crisis. You know, nearly all funding agencies did set up in emergency very quickly calls for proposal that had to review in a few weeks rather than in a few months. Was the quality good enough or not? So there, is, there will be sort of a, a need for a post-examination, a post-assessment here of how well did that work during the crisis. Then you have to counteract the concern that peer review tends towards conservative, and I mentioned that earlier. Basically, peer review is done by a panel, by a group. And, and if you have, when you have a group, they tend to eliminate extremes. Obviously, you're going to, to eliminate the extremely bad, that's good, but you also are going to, to tend to exclude the extremely new, because basically you're going to say, mm, that's not going to work, or that, that's bizarre, you know, that, I've never heard about that, you know, what, what is he thinking about, you know, this, this is, you know, so maybe in your panel, you will have someone who will say, well, yeah, we should, we should try it, you know, let's try it, but so the rest will say, no, let's, you know, let's play safe, okay, let's just form the one we are pretty sure they are going to work because they are going to publish and this is what people expect, etc. Okay, so that's an issue. Uh, so the, the question here is, how do you develop funding mechanisms and assessment mechanisms that can still support transformative research, interdisciplinary research, um, you know, things which is out of the ordinary. And then you have to develop this evaluation criteria to assess not only scientific excellence, the traditional bottom-up system where okay you have a call for good research proposal and you evaluate you know the quality etc and you have additional criteria and this is incre increasingly true in many instances you're not only interested in just scientific quality but you're interested in something else so it can be i want that to have a benefit for society i want that to have a benefit for the economy i want that to uh, to be, you know, truly interdisciplinary or, you know, having additional objectives. And this is a limit of the evaluation system because your evaluators did not necessarily know how to evaluate that. You know, how do you evaluate societal impact? If you are, a, I don't know, say a molecular geneticist, you have no idea. You're not trained for that. You don't have any knowledge. And if the funding agency does not provide you know, sort of a guidelines to help the panel to evaluate those extra scientific criteria, it's extremely hard. It becomes extremely subjective. And, and then, at, you know, the last point, which is declining success rates. Success rates. Um, this is a real challenge because obviously, increasingly, we, we see in many countries that funding rely on competitive mechanism. Researchers rely on that, institutions rely on those. And that means they have more and more application 
um, and the resources are not, not necessarily you know, following through. That means declining success rate. And here you have a real challenge. What we see, and next slide please, basically is that if you, if you, are, um, if you are below 10%, what researchers tell us and panel, you know, panel evaluators tell us, this is lottery. It's just not possible to evaluate proposal if you keep only 10% of those. What usually they tell us is, on average, when you have a call, you have about one third of very good proposal that people feel, feel they should be funded. One third of, okay, more or less good, uh, could be improved, okay, it's a shame if they are not funded, but they could be improved, okay? And one that of sort of pretty bad, they, they, they are not very good, not very well written, uh, they out of the scope, etc. So that's fine, it's, they are, those are easy to reject. If you are below one third of success rates, then that means you're going to start eliminating good proposal. And the further down you go in success rates, the more good proposal you eliminate. And a, a, a panel is not equipped to do that. You know, they cannot choose between one good proposal and another good proposal. It becomes completely subjective. It's not scientific. It's not peer review. You know, they don't have the criteria for that. So that's a real problem. So among the recommendations that, you know, we raise in the report, uh, first, we said you have to evaluate the true cost of your competitive funding scheme to see whether it's, it's worth doing it or not. Or whether you know just doing the traditional core funding to institution and give them the freedom to allocate resources to your team that's probably you know sufficient if you don't have a strategic objective then you should develop experiments in competitive funding scheme again as we mentioned for the COVID-19 because there might be different ways to assess proposal beside the traditional system that can work again they have to be tailored to your objective you should promote experimental approach, um, particularly when you look at interdisciplinarity and breakthrough research. You know, we are doing a work on high risk, high reward research, and clearly the traditional approach does not work. Again, because there is this accountability system where you know, both the founder and the panel believe and feel that they have to make sure that you know, the proposal that are accepted are going to deliver. But if you are a high risk, by definition, it's not going to work 100% of the time. If it works 20% of the time, it doesn't mean, of course, that you're not going to have anything. But you're not going to deliver what you said you would deliver on time because you're taking a risk. Now, it could deliver something great later on, or you might find something completely different. But this is not, you know, there is, a, again, a, a challenge here that is difficult to take into account in the traditional system. Now, again, governments are encouraged to study how public research you know, support is allocated to address broader societal challenge. As I mentioned again, this is increasingly one of the criteria through which projects are assessed. You know, basically, governments, you know, etc., the society says, well, you know, we don't just want science, we want something for society, you know, which is a benefit for society. But that usually traditional panels do not know how to assess. So they have to be provided some guidelines, some training, and you have to agree, you know, what you, you really want to assess, because societal uh, benefit can be extremely broad. It's very hard to assess. And then again, you have countries are encouraged to take steps to improve the collection of data of analysis and share information between funders so that's how it can work. You can improve the system. Okay, to get more comparison. Next slide, please. So I'm going to work to go down to the assessment system now. So the reviewing process. Well, how does it work? Okay, usually quite you know quite you know quite often and increasingly often, you have an initial screening step. Um, either it's a way just to ensure that the proposal is eligible to the funding. And here, usually, you know, you have a low percentage of rejection, or it is the first step of assessment. And that can really decrease the burden on the evaluation panel. So this is why, actually, it's usually implemented. They have to submit shorter proposal in the first stage. They are assessed, and then they go to a second stage with a more developed proposal. However, 
what we found is that the process for that initial screening is not very well you know, described, it's not transparent. And usually the scientific community do not really understand how is that assessed, what are the criteria. There is a transparency problem here. Then you go down to the traditional review panels and committees. That's you know, what the large majority of funding schemes do have. In some cases, they also have oral interviews by panel or jury. Usually, what the panels do is advisory, so they don't decide, and the founder at the end of the day decide, but there are exceptions. In which case, in some cases, actually, the reviewing system panel actually decides whether you know they are going to be funded or not, not just a recommendation, and they can also provide some information on the amount of funding uh, that can be provided. Usually, they provide some ranking of the proposal, but you know when you have ten percent of success rate, that's when you hit a wall. Next slide, please. So here, you know, the, you have a, a number of challenges for the reviewers. Um, what we found is that reviewers may receive very different numbers of proposals to review between, you know, a few to up to 20. And you can see, uh, you know, straight away, you know, there is going to be a difference in the quality of the evaluation. If you have three or four proposals, particularly, you know, if you can say, yeah, these rules I can I can review properly, then you will have a good reviewing. Not necessarily the right one in function of your objective, but a good review. If you have to review 20, you know, beside your work, then it's going to be just screening, a light reviewing. Each proposal may also be reviewed by a various number of reviewers, as I mentioned, usually two to five, but it depends. And we don't have really have data to tell, you know, this is better, you know, three is better than two, five is better than three. It's hard to tell, but basically what people say is three to four is good, okay? But just no really empiric evidence. In smaller countries, usually you have international reviewers. It does help reduce potential bias and, and uh, obviously because people know each other, they, you know, they can be conflict of interest, so to wait to avoid those conflict of interest and also to reach out to discipline, you know, excellence in disciplines that maybe the country does not have. Reviewers may be recruited to very different means. They can be open calls, list of previous reviewers, sometimes with some minimal percentage of turnover, uh, nomination by the panel chair or recommendation by, you know, the reviewing panel, suggestion by applicants, you know, um, election by a scientific committee, everything. There can be a mix between internal and external reviewers, if the funding agencies have some internal reviewers, and a mix of peers and experts, which is something slightly different. The experts will have you know, different competencies than the peers which are taken from the scientific community. Now, one element which is worth noting is that right now, for reviewers, there is typically a 25 to 35% acceptance rate, meaning that if you are a founder and you ask a scientist to review some proposal, about one in three will accept. And that's going down. Again, because so many countries rely on competitive funding, that's, you know, the good reviewers, they are, they, they are much in demand, too much in demand. And that creates a, a gap, which is, you know, why we have to come back to the, the first element is, do you really need competitive funding? And, and finally, a real problem we found is that proposers are really given the opportunity to respond to reviews. What does that mean? That's basically, you have your review panel, they are wrong, they may you know, make a few remarks on the proposal, they send back that, and this is it. And this is bad. Why is it bad? Because sometimes the reviewer may not completely understand what the proposal meant. Or maybe there are some gaps in the proposal and the reviewer is going to say, no, that's not going to work or, you know, um, you know, it's not relevant or whatever. But, you know, imagine that your um, proposal system is in English and you have a proposal coming from a country with, where the scientists are not very good English speakers. So the proposal will not be very well explained, but still the proposal might be great. So there is a number of issues here. 
if you don't give the opportunity for the reviewer for the panelist for the proposer sorry for the proposer to respond to some questions then you may miss some very interesting proposal next slide please and then there is a question of appeal system again very few Sonic seems do have an appeal system. What do we mean by an appeal system? Which, which is basically saying, well, I was rejected, can I appeal? When usually there is an appeal system, it means that the applicant believes the procedure was not carried out properly according to the rules of the funders. Uh, so it's a formal appeal. But very few schemes have a mechanism that allow for a review of the substance of the proposal, either by the same reviewing panel or by a different group saying, well, no, I'm sorry, you did not accept it, but from what I, you know, I saw from your comments, you did not understand what you meant. You know, you forgot that and that. So, all proposal was not reviewed properly. Please take into account these additional elements. Of course, it would have a cost. It would have a, a, a cost in time. If you, it would basically increase the time for reviewing. So, you have to balance that with, versus the efficiency of the system. But it's a, it's a fair way uh, to evaluate proposal. What we also found is very few agencies, funding agencies, do have innovative process. And, you know, it's a bit of a shame because, as we said, um, you have to tailor your, your assessment system to your objective. Um, for instance, reducing prescriptive elements in the calls, um, having funding agreements to foster flexibility, saying, you know, okay, um, I, I'm giving you that funding, but if you need more, you know, you might get more. Uh, if you need less, you know, you might get less. Okay, um, and mechanism to foster innovative ideas. You know, um, you know, pilot micro grants, for instance, you know, to test new ideas, and then if it works, you get additional funding, um, like the ERC proof of concept grant, which is you say, okay, it's a try. You know, we know it's risky, but we we'll give you some seed money, right, etc. Um, mechanism to retain a proposal based on a strong novelty. You know, despite you know being a lower rank, uh, flexibility in the ranking criteria, saying okay, this is traditionally the the ranking criteria that we have, but we found that that proposal it did not score very high on that ranking, but it was really interesting. Right, we, we should fund it. Okay, so that that usually is not there in many processes. They are you know they are usually on silos and they don't they don't they are not very flexible. Next slide, please. Okay, finally, you know, the challenges for the peer review itself. Again, you know, one of the challenges to match the reviewing system with the objective of the funding mechanism. There is a large difference in needs and project time between disciplines and projects. For instance, if you review a project in mathematics, it's not to do the same at all as it is, you know, a large project in, in you know, I don't know, biology or whatever. Okay, um, so you should not have the same assessment process. The question here is how do you adapt evaluation criteria, guidelines, and marks to your objectives? And I don't have a perfect solution here, but just you have to think about it. And finally, and that's even truer when you talk about interdisciplinarity, is the panel competent to assess all the criteria? Again, we have mentioned the problem of societal impact. You know, a traditional scientist is not equipped to assess that. You just cannot do it, okay? So this is a you know, a gap here. Either you have to have you need a more mixed panel or you need to train your panel. Then there is question of trust, which is extremely important. You know, basically the scientific community has to trust the system, the evaluation process, expert nomination, conflict of interest, etc., the quality. It has to be transparent, it has to be street trustworthy. At the same time, you know, the quality of the system has to be there, you know, expert nomination, the number of experts per project, or number of projects per expert, I was mentioned earlier, the competencies of reviewers, mm -hmm. that's part of the trust system, the, the quality of the system. Then learning and teaching, getting feedback from the users, you should ask your users, you know, at the end of the day, what did you evaluate for funding scheme? And not just think that you should assess your, the users, you know, the reverse is true, and provide feedback to the users, as I mentioned earlier. Again, the, pro, the question of autonomy and flexibility, you should adapt your criteria, adapt your funding to the needs, which is very important. Next slide, please. Managing risk, you know, we have said that earlier. This is 
this is hard. Let, let's be honest, this is hard. Um, the, taking risk is difficult for a public, a public body, any public body, uh, because you have this accountability of spending public money. Uh, but you need to find a way because usually, actually, your government is quite keen on providing, you know, transformative research. So you need to, to strike the right balance. And sometimes it means that you need specific systems, specific mechanisms which are adapted for high risk innovative ideas. Managing interdisciplinary, I know you have a session, so we won't go back to that uh, in detail. Age and gender bias, that's again very important. Um, what we found is an increasing number of funders have accepted that you cannot use the same criteria of assessment for younger researchers. Obviously, if you use traditional indicators, and I'm sure we'll come back to the discussion on indicators, um, you cannot ask a young researcher to have 20 pages of publications, right? Okay. Um, and, and so that's obviously a need to have different criteria, and that, that is getting better. But on female applicants here, there is clearly a, 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 um, a problem. Um, funders are not yet aware of the problem because the problem is not really um, tangible. Uh, what we find is that usually good proposals can be sort of daring proposals in a way. You have to put yourself in, you know, ahead. You know, you have to say, you know, this is great. I'm, I'm going to a great job. I'm coming from a great lab, etc. And male tend to do that more than female researchers. You know, female researchers tend to be more cautious both regarding the proposal and regarding themselves. And that's a challenge because traditionally, even in expert panel, you will find a majority of men and it just cultivates the same culture. So that's a challenge which up to now we have found is not very well taken into account in the system. Avoid negative side effects. You know, that's a problem if you have bad reviewing criteria, that means you may prevent good scientists from getting applied. And we have a very good example from Japan. We are clearly, they say, we have a problem. Uh, all panels, they tend to really have a bias towards the best institution. If you are researchers from a good institution, you are much more likely to be funded, whatever the project. And that, it's bad for the system because you may have a very good proposal from a good scientist, but from a less well-known university, and it won't get funded. And then, you know, what I mentioned, managing low success rates. You know, it's a real challenge for everybody. How do you avoid rejecting good proposal? And one way that some of the funders have, have found is that I have to narrow down the, the scope of my proposal. You know, if I get 500 proposals and I found 10 of those, this is a waste for everybody. So I would rather receive 25 proposals and found 10 of those then you know it's worth it so i have to be more precise and then improve the system meaning you have to monitor your efficiency you know whether you respond to your criteria you respond to your objective and you need good impact assessment methodology i believe that was the last slide yes thank you Muy bien. Eh, muchas gracias a Dr. Gag por su intervención. Y a continuación escucharemos la segunda ponencia de este panel a cargo de la doctora Anna Hatch, quien representa a la, a la organización DORA. La doctora Hatch es la directora de programas dentro de DORA y previo a esto ella obtuvo su doctorado en bioquímica, además de contar con una trayectoria de participación y de asesoría en ciencia y sociedad. Escuchamos ahora la doctora Anna Hatch. So, Dr. Hatch, it's uh, time for you for your intervention. Wonderful. Can everyone see my slides? Fantastic. Thank you so much for this kind invitation to participate today. I'm delighted um, to be here and share some thoughts on academic assessment. As Pedro said, my name is Anna, and I'm the program director for the Declaration on Research Assessment. It's called DORA for short. Um, and DORA is an initiative to advance practical and robust approaches to research assessment globally and across all scholarly disciplines. So we have a pretty wide purview 
Um, and today I'm going to examine sort of how the entire academic system is influenced by the ways that research is assessed. So, you know, just to give you a little bit of history, Dora began and as a conversion at the 2012 annual meeting for the American Society for Cell Biology, when a group of researchers and scholarly editors were having a conversation about the consequences of using the journal impact factor and other proxy measures of prestige, like institution, um, as a primary indicators of how research quality is evaluated um, and what effect that was having on the academic workforce um, and what effects it was having on research culture. So, you know, part of what came out of this conversation then um, was why, why do we need a statement like DORA? And that is primarily because journal-based indicators um, do not provide reliable information about individual articles or researchers. And on the screen right now, I'm just showing a briefing document that Dora created and released this spring that highlights five common myths about evaluation, particularly the use of journal-based indicators like the journal impact factor in evaluation. So I encourage you all to check that out. Um, the other thing of, you know, really how DORA became conceptualized was that there's a need to consider the value and impact of all research outputs and not just the journals or the venues where work is published. And I think Dominique Babini from Claxo in Argentina said it best um, that when you think about areas such as agriculture and health um, and other developmental ch challenges that stakeholder opinion and the use and uptake of research results is just as important as citations um, and again venue. And then the last thing that I want everyone to start thinking about is how journal based metrics and university rankings put pressure on academic institutions to publish in specific venues. And here I go to a quote from Ariana Besserell in an interview that she did, um, where she talks about how rankings are really sort of driving university agendas and becoming very decisive in hiring and promotion. So it's, no, it's not an exaggeration to say um, that academic assessment is a big challenge. And in fact, that's why I have this image of a young researcher looking up at a big, date, big gate because it's a very, very tough problem. Um, and in fact, it's considered to be a systems problem. So this is something that every stakeholder, such as funders, like we're talking about today, academic institutions, publishers, and researchers themselves, um, all have a role in reshaping the academic culture. And so, you know, digging a little bit deeper into understanding some of the challenges with the assessment system and funders, I think it's helpful to sort of look out and see different perspectives. Um, so here, what I'm just showing you is the idea that universities have to balance their external pressures, such as getting grant funding, um, and their university rankings to attract more students. Um, they have to balance that and make a trade-off then with their, with their internal institutional values that are encapsulated in their mission and vision statements. And this it can include a variety of things, but some common ones that I routinely see crop up are student learning, research discovery, societal impacts, collaboration, creating an inclusive environment. Um, so this is a particular trade-off that universities balance with, but it also propagates down to the level of the individual researcher. And here, I'd just like to point to a very lovely preprint by Naomi Albert Bonn and Wim Pixton in Belgium, where they find that what advances academic careers does not necessarily advance science. Um, so in their work, they found that, you know, what's driving a career is publications, citations, and grant funding, but yet that doesn't always translate to pushing science forward, which really has to do with things like open scholarship practices, 
collaboration, um, conducting research with integrity. And so I think in seeing these different motivations, it's easier to understand the problem and then to take sort of a funder view of how, how to make improvements. And so, you know, Dora is tackling <laughs> these challenges um, really to improve the ways that research is assessed and to improve research assessment itself. And I think one of the things that Dora thinks very strongly is that if we improve research assessment, we also improve research and we meet the research outcomes and objectives that we would like to see. Um, so on the screen now, I'm showing you Dora's objectives and approaches as an initiative. So we're really here to raise awareness about responsible research assessment to facilitate implementation of new practices at funders at academic institutions to catalyze change across disciplines. Again, we're international, so to across different geographical regions as well, and also to improve equity in the process. And we have a number of approaches to help us meet these goals, um, primarily through a lot of community engagement, through resource development. I showed you that briefing document at the beginning, through partnerships, um, Dora helped the Royal Society in the United Kingdom collect feedback on their latest structured narrative CV format. Um, we co-sponsored a meeting with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in the United States on responsible assessment. We also advise specific academic institutions and funding agencies as needed too. Um, and again, we do convening, so bringing people together to have discussions about academic assessment. Um, and none of this would be possible without our international advisory board. Um, so we have a board, um, and this is the group that Dora turns to for strategic advice and guidance um, that really helps shape the direction of our initiative. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Christian gonzalez Villal um, from the University of Chile as part of this advisory group. And like others on the board, he provides not only his academic expertise, but also knowledge is a liaison to Dora in the area. Okay, so coming back, so Dora is an initiative, but we started as a declaration. And this is a dec declaration that organizations and individuals, and I'm just showing you a quick trend in, in signers, you'll see that um, in the end of 2017, this is when Dora relaunched into a formal initiative. This is when um, I was hired to my position. There's a little uptick in the amount of new organizational signers, but there's a much larger uptick um, when Redelic announced in September of 2018 that all journals that they index must adhere to and sign the Dora principles. Um, so as of today, um, or as of last night when I was preparing my slides, more than 2,000 organizations and 16 individuals have signed DORA. And I have a word cloud here that visualizes the geographic distribution of DORA's organizational signatories. Um, 42 of them come from Chile, and these are largely academic journals. Um, a number of international funders have also signed DORA. Um, and I have a list of them here, um, but this is by no means a comprehensive set. So DORA, for funders, organizes a virtual quarterly meeting. Um, right now we have about 30 public and private research funders that join in the group. It's probably about 50 people total. Um, and the goal of this quarterly meeting really is to increase communication amongst funders for research assessment reform and to spread good research assessment practices more rapidly. So we believe that more communication about experiments in assessment will lead to greater and faster adoption of good practices. Um, and here I just have a snapshot of one of the blogs that we wrote. So each funder call that we have is accompanied by a blog post that's put up on the DORA website. Um, and again, this is just another mechanism to increase communication about good practices and different things that funders are trying. In this particular funder call, whoops, 
uh, we heard from the Swiss National Science Foundation and the Dutch Research Council. Um, these are two funding agencies that are experimenting with what's called a narrative CV format. So the traditional CV, um, which focuses a lot on publications and journal name, this provides a complement where researchers provide a structured narrative highlighting their achievement that provides a balance to the metrics. So you're contextualizing contributions and of distilling her. Um, and I'll get to some of the stuff that Welcome Trust is doing in a little bit. Okay, so as part of the meeting that Dora organized with the Howard Hughes funder or Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, this is a in the United States, um, we developed a set of design principles to help funders and academic institutions to take action. And this really is to help ex institutions experiment with and improve their own practices. Um, and so I'll go through some examples of each of these now. So the first one is the idea of I instilling standards and structure into processes. Um, I mentioned the narrative CV, CV format. It's something not only that the Swiss National Science Foundation is working on, um, but also the Dutch Research Council. Um, and in fact, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, UKRI, um, which I know I think you'll hear from Francis Downey a little bit later in the seminar series, they also announced that they're rolling out the resume for researcher again, which is this structured narrative format CV. And I think what's really powerful about a structured narrative format CV is two things that I might have alluded to already, but they're important, so I'll emphasize them here. And one is that it contextualizes the metrics or traditional indicators of prestige, like institution or who, who a researcher was trained by, um, where the work was published. Um, but what it also does is it gives the people who are doing the evaluating a structured format to go through each application. So it really encourages an even assessment across the pool of applicants. Okay, the other thing that I wanna to touch on is this idea of fostering a sense of personal accountability. Um, so it, it's not enough for a funding agency to put a policy in place if the folks who are doing the evaluating don't um, put the policy into practice. And of course, there are a number of different um, engagement strategies to encourage personal accountability. Um, one of them is the webinar series that we're part of today, which is just having a conversation about what does responsible assessment look like. Um, and I have a list on the slide, again, of, of different examples of what this can look like, but all it boils down to is engaging with the academics and the researchers about how to do responsible assessment, why it's important, and how that helps create, um, or sorry, not create, but accelerate academic progress and accelerate research. Um, and here I just point out an article that was written by Rins Benedictus um, and Frank Medina and Mark Ferguson about work done at the University Medical Center Utrecht. I think there's this particularly interesting um, where they held a series of town halls that they then used to create a new policy and they felt that they had much greater uptake of the policy within their scholarly community um, because they incorporated feedback beforehand. Okay, so the second and the third principle then really is prioritizing equity and transparency. Again, there's a number of different ways to do this. Um, one really interesting interesting idea is using neutral parties to promote balanced discussion. So this can be something as simple as having someone in on a peer review meeting um, who is not there to judge the proposal, but when someone brings up the name of an institution or we can trust them because they're associated with, you know, very prestigious organization, um, that that person can then step in and say, yes, but that's not an assessment criteria. So we don't incorporate that. And again, this isn't a silver bullet solution. 
um, but it's a risk mitigation strategy or tactic to bring the focus back to the merit of the proposal rather than some of this surrogate proxy measure. Um, and some of the other ideas I have here are more applied towards academic institutions. I particularly like this article by Nidhi Bala that has specific strategies for equity and faculty hiring. Okay, and then another principle that I want to highlight is the idea of re refining processes through iterative feedback. I think the Welcome Trust is a fantastic example of this. Um, so they have a new research assessment policy that's going into effect starting January 2021 um, that mirrors their open access policy. But how, I think the story here is how they created the policy. Um, and so they first drafted a policy saying that all of their organizations um, that receive money from Welcome must adhere to DOOR principles. Um, and then they went out to the community to solicit feedback on their draft proposal. Um, heard back from, I think, about 50 organizations is what I remember hearing, and then used that to create the final policy. Um, so again, you're refining policies and practices through feedback as an element of a community engagement, which, which helps increase adoption of new practices. And the last thing, things that I really wanted to touch on briefly is that, again, we're here to help organizations, um, funders, as well as academic institutions and researchers really think about good policies and practices. So we have a list of good practices on our website. We also have a list of resources um, to help people think through good pra practices. And then I also want to draw your attention to uh, this one pager. So this is what I've sort of been alluding to through the whole talk is the five common myths about why journal impact factors aren't effective tools for, for individual um, and the five design principles. But then accompanying that is a new brief um, that we were pleased to publish just last Tuesday. And again, you can find it under the resources section on our website. But this is really examining how individual cognitive biases emerge in research assessment practices. And these include things like the Matthew effect, um, anchoring bias, something called status quo bias, um, and how these manifest at institutional levels. And so we provide strategies that institutions can use to combat these biases in decision making. Um, and then the last thing, I think this is mainly for all of the researchers on the call is, you know, in thinking about what can I do um, to help change the research culture, you know, think about signing DORA, ask institutions and employers to review their assessment practices, just like Annette is doing here today. Um, you're more than welcome to refer back to our collection of good practices and then to let us know about good practices so that we can put them back up on the website and again, reach out to others. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize that um, DORA is one initiative to improve scholarly assessment, but we're certainly not the only initiative. Um, so FOLEC is one in Latin America. It's led by Laura Ravelli, who I believe you'll also be hearing from, um, and she is a DORA advisory board member as well. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. DORA is supported by a number of organizations. Um, and so, of course, we give our continued support for them for allowing us to operate. Um, thank you. Um, agradecemos una vez más eh, la intervención de la doctora Hannah Hatch. Y a continuación, haremos un espacio para preguntas de los participantes. Eh, para ello, es importante que um, escriban su pregunta en el chat y luego le cedemos la palabra. ¿Alguien quisiera eh, hacer una pregunta? Catalina, ¿sabes si alguien tiene ha hecho alguna pregunta en el chat? Y... Está Andreas eh, Reisinger. Reis... Ah, ya, yeah. de acuerdo. Acabo de abrirle el micrófono. Ok. 
Ok, doctor Andrea Reisenegger, le escuchamos. Hi, I have a question for Anna. Um, uh, well, what uh, the, the principles that Dora is promoting intuitively make a lot of sense. And I am also against these um, uh, metrics, uh, the journal metrics for scientific assessment. But I would like to know, have there been studies to assess whether the principles that you are promoting are actually working better than previous ways of assessing science? In, this, in, in, the, in, uh, in actually uh, um, achieving the goals that you are promoting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the short answer is that we're working on it. Um, so we have, so we created the set of the five the five design prin principles, and now we're working on developing a framework that will allow academic institutions to evaluate the outcomes of any interventions or experiments that they do to improve academic assessment. Um, this is a project that we're conducting with Professor Ruth Schmidt. Um, who is a behavioral design professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology in the United States. Um, so as part of that project, we sent out a survey. Um, we have about 70 responses from people all around the world. And then we had a series of three focus groups to really think about what are indicators of progress and knowing that an academic assessment policy would fall under this category of responsible research assessment and it's making improvements. Um, unfortunately, it's the research is still in progress, um, but hoping to be able to give a more complete answer, I'd say around December is our goal for wrapping that project up. Um, but the idea, again, is we wanted to give the design principles to encourage experimentation, but we didn't want to leave academic institutions um, without a way to evaluate the success of what they're doing. Um, so that's, that's our big project now, and hopefully that will be able to answer your question. I'm just sorry that it has to take a couple more months instead of right now. Okay, great. Good luck with that. Thank you. Yeah, this takes a lot of uh, effort. So things move uh, little by little. Next question, we hear now Dr. Christian Gonzalez from University of Chile. Dr. Gonzalez. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question for uh, either of you, and it's related with the fact that when we start thinking about the new mechanism or new initiative for research assessment, so this is kind of a big question because uh, we are supposed to, to make the assessment for across disciplines for many different disciplines which are not uh, intrinsically uh, equal. So, so I, I would like to both to, to share your ideas of, of how uh, the system should evolve to preserve the commonalities across disciplines, but also to include singularities which are very relevant to, to, to have a, a real transparent and, and fair approach to research assessment. Anna, maybe you want to start on that. I can say a few words afterwards. Yeah. So I think, I mean, you make such an excellent point, Christian. Um, and I have to call it, Christian is a DORA advisory board member. I'm so very pleased that he's able to be here today too. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting is that there are a lot of trade-offs that need to be made. And I, I referenced some of them in my talk about sort of external pressures and internal values of institutions. And I think this is an, another great example of you want a process that has enough flexibility so that it can be applied across disciplines but you want it to be granular enough so that it's still meaningful for a specific discipline. And here, I think the way forward for change is thinking about processes um, and stand, sort of processes and structure of a process rather than specific standards and criteria. So I think if there can be a, po a process that can be adopted by multiple scholarly disciplines, and then it up to those disciplines then to figure out sort of the best 
criteria and standards. Is that what you were getting at, Christian? So if, if you go to um, funding mechanisms and even broader, if, you know, more generally uh, regarding assessment, there are clear differences between disciplines. I mean, obviously there are common criteria. You talk about scientific excellence, even though it may not mean exactly the same thing if you are in social sciences or in mathematics, there is a common understanding within the disciplines of what is going to be um, scientific excellence. Um, however, there will usually be difference in the additional criteria. And this is where, you know, there is a need to have some flexibility because usually you assess based on a number of criteria and, and those will not be the same whether again, you assess a, a project in mathematics or you assess a project in engineering. Obviously, you cannot expect, you know, the same delivery. So there is to be a, a need for flexibility here and this has to be agreed uh, by the founder or by the institution. Otherwise, you know, if you take uh, all the discipline in the same pot, you know, some will be advantages or disadvantages in function of your criteria. You need some flexibility in the criteria. Yes. Eh, muchas gracias, doctor González, por esa pregunta. Y ahora vamos a ceder la palabra, la, vamos a ceder el micrófono a Mirenis Sánchez quien tiene una pregunta para ambos expositores. Mirenis, te escuchamos. Gracias, Pedro. La puse en el chat realmente. Es que el expositor de la OSD se refería a los modelos tradicionales de evaluación y según la traducción hablaba de algunos elementos o criterios más extensos que tienen que ver directamente con el impacto económico y social y con la transdisciplinaridad. En realidad nosotros en Chile, al menos desde nuestra agencia, estamos haciendo un arduo trabajo para ir avanzando en esa dirección. Entonces, eh, mi percepción es que todavía trabajamos en, en un formato de evaluación que rige en paralelo el modelo tradicional con uno más de esta altura. La pregunta sería, si nos centramos en la calidad de los proyectos y considerando las implicancias económicas que tiene financiar un proyecto de esta naturaleza, que rompa un poco con el modelo tradicional, la recomendación de ustedes sería avanzar sistemáticamente hacia un modelo que incluya impacto económico y social y transdisciplinaridad, o podrían funcionar ambos modelos en paralelo. Gracias. It's, it's, it's perfectly legitimate to have both criteria. Uh, again, it depends on the objective of the founder but it's perfectly legitimate to expect some socioeconomic benefit from a number of projects besides scientific quality. And a number of funders do have that. The, the challenge here is what are the evaluation indicators? Uh, what are the, the, the indicators to evaluate the potential socioeconomic impact? Uh, first, there's going to be a, a difference between disciplines, that's for sure. Uh, again, here you need some transparency for the proposers. Um, otherwise, for them, it's going to be difficult to include potential socioeconomic impact um, in their proposition besides, you know, probably, you know, expectations, etc. So you need to provide some guidelines here. Uh, otherwise, it's difficult for everybody, for, for everybody, both for you in terms of evaluation and for the proposers to include that in its proposition. It's hard for me to tell you know, what it should be, but there are some examples. A number of agencies have already included that. For example, um, in Ireland, I think it's a Science Foundation Ireland, they, they ask the proposer to, to cite what are the potential socioeconomic impact of their proposition. And then during the uh, project, then they have to report whether there was some of the deliverable which were rich or not, you know, at the first year, second year, third year, etc. So there is, so in the criteria, the criteria is not so much how much societal impact you will have, but it's to, to force the proposer to think about it and to already think that what could be measured within this project. So it's an indirect way to have that and more to to make sure that the scientists will think about that besides just a scientific project. In others, like I said, for the Finnish Academy, 
within some of their projects, there is a clear um, mark for socioeconomic impact, which is given by the um, by the review panel. And for my feedback, I know this is challenging. Um, it does require a lot of training of the panels to be able to provide sort of a, a mark or a rank based on just a criteria because they are not used to it. So it does require some transparency and some guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with everything that you've, you've said. And I think that's almost part of the, the power of the structured narrative is that it provides a space where researchers can contextualize these societal impacts. Um, but the much more challenging part is then how do you evaluate sort of the quality and the level of impacts that you see. And there have been a number of frameworks that have been put forward. Um, I think the, the one that I know the best is the RQ plus framework that was developed for sort of international development research um, came from a group in Canada. Um, there's also another framework, CVAD um, from France. And again, sort of looking at how you can evaluate societal impacts. But just like Fred said, the, the challenge is finding the, ti the time and energy to do the evaluation for them. Bien, eh, esa era la pregunta de Mirenis. Muchas gracias, Mirenis. Le cedemos ahora la palabra a Carolina Guzmán, quien tiene una pregunta para ambos expositores. Carolina, te escuchamos, te puedes presentar, por favor. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the presentations. My question is about disciplines. I want to come back to the issue of disciplines because I think that flexibility is important, but we need much more than that. Uh, why? I, I work in the field of education, social sciences and humanities. And the literature says that disciplines attached to social sciences and humanities are very context, content, context dependent. That means that there are a lot of language issues, for example. So. We have found, I have been part of the, the, the committee, the Fondesit group of education um, some years, and there is a discussion about how to assess um, productivity because usually social sciences, or at least education, tends to look toward um, web of science publications in English, and that means that the audience for those publications are in the global south, why, sorry, the Global North, while in the Global South, uh, there are other kinds of publications in Spanish, for example, indexed in Cielo or Scopus or Redalic or another index, and they receive um, a, a, lowest, uh, a lower um, uh, score. So there is a dis disciplinary issue, but I think that there are geopolitical issues as well. This North-South divide and what we value as researchers. Research produced for Latin and Latin American context, Chile for example, or whether we publish at least in the social sciences and the humanities, we publish for a, an international audience in English and nobody will or very few people are going to be able to read what we produce. That is, that is my question and concern. Yeah, so, so I think we come back to the, you know, the, the assessment rating, um, but here it's, it's more about impact than just the evaluation of um, the proposal or the project here. Uh, it's looking at the potential impact of the project. And you're perfectly right, in social sciences, usually you tend to have more impact if you are in your native language, because the potential, at least a larger number of potential users are the ones that are using your own language from your country or neighboring countries, uh, rather than very different uh, societal context whereby the potential impact will be less. Uh, so there is a, a discrepancy between the, society, the scientific quality, which as you say, is usually evaluated based on you know, peer-reviewed English journals, English-speaking journals, and the potential impact for society, 
which would more likely be in your native language. And, and we come back to the need to have different criteria here. Um, you know, clearly, if you just use the scientific quality, the bibliographic index, it will not be sufficient to evaluate the, the full range of your impact. Uh, it has to be combined with different types of indicators that take into account the impact on society. And I think increasingly this is something which is, you know, an uptake from institutions, but it's uneven. Uh, it has to permeate the different level of the academy, which can be more traditional in some ways. Anna, maybe you want to complement that. Yeah, absolutely. So I certainly this is something the door thinks a lot about too, and is when uh, I guess <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit to like to find the words so I can say it correctly um, but a lot of social sciences research it has impact in local communities and so I think that comes back to what is valued by the funders and by academic institutions um, you are you fun are you valuing sort of the output and the outcome of the research um, and rather than sort of the venue of where it was published and that I think really needs to be a cultural shift that has to happen. Um, I'm just dropping a link in the chat right now. Um, so there's another great initiative called the Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism and Scholarly Communication. Um, and this group is particularly focused on how can we value diverse language outputs? Um, it's a topic that, Dora, we recently held a webinar on in August, um, working on getting a blog post up um, that sort of summarized the discussion of the webinar. But the consensus of the discussion really was that there's very clearly a frustration at the level of the researcher that their, their work isn't having the out, outcome and impact that they would like to see um, because they're feeling pressure to publish in specific journals to get the funding. Um, and so they're feeling that their work isn't, um, isn't having the maximal output than it could. Um, De acuerdo, eh, muchas gracias por esas respuestas. Ahora le cedemos la palabra para que haga su pregunta a Paulina, quien tiene una pregunta para el doctor Frédéric Scar. Eh, Paulina, ¿podrías presentarte? No, no sé tu apellido, pero eh, tú hiciste una pregunta en el chat. Paulina, te escuchamos. Hola, buenas tardes, ¿me escuchan? Sí. Sí, perfecto. Yeah. No, mi nombre es Paulina Arellano, soy de la Universidad de Playa Ancha, académica, y también estoy investigando un poco este tema de la evaluación científica en Chile, y, eh, pero vinculada a las métricas de información. Yo soy de formación bibliotecaria, entonces como que la bibliometría, la cienciometría por ahí eh, es, es mi tema. Y por lo mismo hice una pregunta a Ana, respecto al rol que juegan las nuevas métricas de información como las alt metrics y las web metrics en las nuevas formas de evaluar el impacto de la investigación, porque ya sabemos que nos sirven mucho para evaluar quizás la calidad científica, pero sí para evaluar eh, el impacto social, pero, pero también hay, 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 hay mucha controversia al respecto. Entonces me gustaría saber su opinión sobre eso, y a Frederick me gustaría preguntarle, eh, él menciona que las mujeres toman menos riesgo en la investigación, y me gustaría saber por qué ellos creen que esto sucede y cómo están fomentando la participación de las mujeres en la investigación científica. No sé si es mucho, pero <ríe> esas eran mis dos preguntas. No, no, Ana, first then. All right, and then, so I think I'm understanding your question correctly. So, so my personal philosophy on metrics is you need to understand what their limitations are. Um, I think there's um, a website, the Metrics Toolkit, that does a really great job um, of highlighting what, what specific limitations are, what they can and what they can't tell you. Um, and I think it really sort of underscores Dora's ideas that you want to look at 
sort of a suite of indicators, both qualitative and um, non-qualitative to make um, measurements and assessments and impacts. Um, the specific indicator that you mentioned, I'm not quite sure of what that is, so I can't speak to it specifically. Um, but I can, what I can speak to is the idea that, um, you know, Dora's main, where, where we really see a challenge is when surrogate metrics are placed onto the level of an individual. So these would be things like journal-based indicators, um, such as the journal impact factor um, or site score. Um, this would also be sort of using a researcher's mentor as a surrogate of like, oh, this person has to be good if they were trained by so-and-so, um, or using the prestige of an institution. Um, so those are the surrogate uh, metrics that we're trying to sort of step away from. Um, and then other indicators, sort of like article level metrics, really um, want to see that in um, collaboration sort of with language narratives that contextualize those indicators. So, so regarding risk taking, um, first, the first feedback we get from founders themselves is that uh, female researchers tend to sell themselves and sell their proposal less than male researchers, where male is going to say, no, we're going to deliver that, this is from your research, etc. A female researcher will say, um, you know, we'll use, it could be, it may be, etc., etc. So they are more careful in, in selling their proposal. And then we're getting high risk, high reward proposal. Uh, we had a, recently a, a workshop in, in April on that topic, and we had a feedback from a Swiss um, uh, manager of a new research funding scheme for high risk, high reward research. And they had a real bias in the proposals. You know, they had far less proposals coming from female researchers than male researchers. And they, they, they realized that probably it was in the way the proposal was framed, you know, and advertised. Basically, say, you know, saying probably we, we invited in the way we wrote or, or, or called for proposal in a way that was more attractive for men that wanted to take risks than female researchers that say, this is not for us. This is not for me. So, so, so it's it's an unconscious bias, and you know I, I'm not an expert, so I have no idea where it comes from. But it's a reality, and and this is, you know, detrimental to research because when you look at the quality of the proposal, there is of course no difference between men and female. So it means, you know, you're going to miss very good proposal because they are not submitted. So. I'm just saying that founders have to be aware of that fact and adapt their process so that they unbias the system. De acuerdo, de acuerdo, sí. Esa era la pregunta de la doctora Paulina desde la quinta región. Ahora escucharemos, um, le cedemos la palabra a Marlene Vargas quien tiene una pregunta también para nuestros panelistas de hoy. Marlene, a ti la palabra. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Buenas tardes, eh, gracias a ambos, a ambos presentadores. Eh, la inquietud principal eh, va por el lado de saber cuáles son sus recomendaciones, sugerencias eh, para el tratamiento de propuestas que son repostuladas a un mismo concurso, que son presentadas nuevamente a un concurso. Eh, quisiera saber eh, cuál es el tratamiento recomendable a ese tipo de propuestas, si se, deben ser evaluadas por el mismo panel, deben ser evaluadas por los mismos revisores, si debe conocerse con anticipación la evaluación eh, de la postulación anterior o si debe conocerse después, qué tratamiento, cuáles son las sugerencias que hay respecto a eso. Muchas gracias. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, basically, 
the first, the first answer is the feedback from the reviewers of the first proposal. In theory, um, if the review is properly done, there should be some information to the proposer to whether you know the proposal might be submitted another time because maybe it's not mature or uh, you know they have too many but you know it's it's good enough uh, as it is it's just that because it didn't have the funding etc so there should be some, some sort of information to the proposer to see whether he should you know he should resubmit or not um and and they are you know i know for instance the, the nsf you know provide some clear information sometimes to to the proposer saying uh, sorry, we could not fund you this time, but please resubmit your proposal to the next session because we consider that the quality is there. But in in the in that case, whether it should be assessed by the same panel is up to the funder. But uh, I believe it might create a you know it might create an issue here. Um, you know, it's uh, ethically it might be difficult. Um, it's hard to tell, but it's up to the funder I think to organize. What we know, however, is that. In some cases, um, there is a possibility for a proposal which has been reviewed by a funder, but could not be funded just because of, of lack of resources, but not of, of the quality of the proposal, to be sent to another funder. For instance, in Europe, the ERC um, is extremely selective and fund less than 10% of the proposal. But it's clearly advertised as, as being extremely selective anyway. So people, when they apply, they know that the success rate will be low because they really take the top of the top. And some countries and some funders at national level have said, okay, if you are accepted in the first round of selection, the first step of selection by the ERC, so they are a two-step process, it means that your proposal is already good enough. It has been reviewed by an international panel and you will be funded or you will be, you know, you have a higher chance to be funded by your national agency. But it's not worth duplicating the reviewing, right? It has been reviewed, it's been considered as very good, but just not good enough for a 10% success rate. But if you go back to a national level, because it had already been reviewed, you know, peer reviewed, then it is either accepted or it, when they have a track for that, or it goes directly to the second round, you know, at national level because you know the first round are already been done. So there can be some agreement between funders, so that you don't have to duplicate and then you know spend resources to review the same proposal. Yeah, I think the the key element I see is a, is transparency, um, and that is you know whatever whatever process is in place for resubmission of proposal that it's transparent to both sort of the evaluators and the people submitting the, the proposal. That's sort of the key takeaway. De acuerdo, eh, muchas gracias. Tenemos espacio para una última pregunta. Y para ello quisiera entonces cederle la palabra a continuación al doctor Erwin Krauskopf. Eh, si pudiera presentarse y y plantear su pregunta, por favor, doctor Krauskopf. Okay, hi. Um, this question is for uh, Anna. My question is, how should impact be assessed? Um, while we're all aware that journal-based citations should be discarded, article-level metrics can only be applied to those articles published by index journals. So citations are available for papers indexed by specific databases, but in the case of the social sciences, arts and humanities, uh, many researchers use books and monographs among other venues uh, to disseminate their results. Yeah, absolutely. So one trend that we've been seeing is the use of, um, so in the, in the United States, we call it a rubric, um, but in, uh, my colleagues in the United Kingdom call it an assessment matrices. Um, and so what this is sort of listing sort of what the criteria are for sort of specific sort of types of impact, whether it's, so it could be sort of like societal impact, um, contribution to new knowledge, um, and different forms. And then for each of those, they have 
sort of a ranking of maybe like one to five and then out of those numbers they give description written descriptions of like what is success in each cat so we've largely seen these um, emerge as a way to evaluate contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, also as a mechanism to evaluate um, contributions to teaching and mentorship. Um, we're just starting to hear about using these as a way to really examine impact. Um, I think the RQ Plus framework, again, was sort of developed by this group in Canada looking more at the social sciences and societal like how do you how do you examine societal impact and that not in, only included sort of these rubrics but it also included um qualitative pieces of evidence like reaching out to sort of the consumers of the research or the local areas that were being affected and like how has this helped you and like given written statements of course that is only um, relevant to very specific research areas, but I think the emergence of as as we're starting to really contextualize what impact is and having a common vocabulary about the types of impact that the like the first step is to create sort of a common syntax or a common language, and once we have that nailed down, then I think it'll be easier to figure out how to make these measurements. In the meantime, I think a very nice um, transitional step is using narrative statements to contextualize contributions like these societal impacts. Okay, thanks. Bien, esa era entonces la última pregunta para nuestro panel. Debí haberles mencionado al comienzo que este seminario está siendo grabado, espero que no les incomode. Luego compartiremos la, las coordenadas para esta grabación en sus correos electrónicos. Y para hacer un cierre de este primer encuentro, quisiera cederle la palabra a continuación a la directora Alejandra Vidales, quien está a cargo del eje de proyectos de investigación. Eh, doctora Vidales, le escuchamos. Gracias, Pedro. Muchas gracias a nuestros expositores. Eh, muy interesante la presentación. Para nosotros es eh, un tremendo desafío enfrentarnos a todo aquello que ustedes han mencionado muy bien respecto al proceso de evaluación. Eh, me quedo con una de las palabras de Hanna respecto a que mejorar el proceso de evaluación es también mejorar el impacto de la investigación. Y eso es en parte lo que estamos empezando a trabajar en la, en la nueva institucionalidad con la agencia, con el ministerio. Eh, muchas gracias a todos los asistentes, tuvimos una gran concurrencia, los dejo invitados para el día 13 y el día 15 de la próxima semana, que vienen los siguientes paneles. Eh, la idea es que este seminario se constituya como un punto de partida en, en alimentar y provocar la discusión respecto a los modelos de evaluación eh, que tenemos que tener para poder instalar una buena institucionalidad de investigación en, en nuestro actual sistema. ¿sí? Así que muchas gracias, los dejo invitados para el 13 y para el 15, que son los siguientes paneles. Vamos a estar registrando de todas maneras las preguntas que, estu que no quedaron, eh, es que, no, que no pudieron ser eh, incluidas por temas de tiempo. Eh, y muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is fabulous. Muy bien. Muchas gracias.